Wonderful. I am delighted to be here. Again, Michael Roosevelt, Senior uh, Court Service Analyst with the Criminal Justice Services. Well, why are we doing uh, this broadcast, Judicial Council? Uh, we think it's important that uh, courts come together from time to time to discuss important and critical issues that relate directly to their work. The Lunchbox series is an attempt to have an ongoing conversation about what we can do to better understand what the research says and what are the best practices when it comes to adult drug courts. We call this adult drug court lunchbox, but it's for everyone and anyone, for drug courts, non-drug courts, or any other type of collaborative courts. We hope following this broadcast webinar, you'll have an opportunity to kick off ongoing and continuing discussions among your team members about the drug court adult standards. A note, the viewpoints presented during the series do not reflect that of the National Association of Drug Court Professionals or the Judicial Council. This is simply presented as education for your understanding and opportunity to have a dialogue. Well, well let's get us started. Uh, so let's get a picture from our audience. Um, what is the ideal population for whom drug court programs should be targeted? So let's pose the following question. Which population should drug courts target? Let's see how everyone did. Uh, if you answered D, high risk, high need, you answered the question correctly and consistent with the research of Dr. Doug Marlowe, a researcher with NDCI, professor and editor of the Drug Court Journal, who shares that people who do the best and are those who are those at greater risk and with a higher need, because that population is the one for which these programs were designed and intended for. Again, I would like to thank you for being here today, and I am delighted to introduce Ms. Deb Sima, Treatment Court Coordinator, San Bernardino, and a volunteer staff for the California Association of Collaborative Courts. Deborah Sima has been the Drug Court Coordinator for Superior Court of San Bernardino since 1997. She oversees seven drug courts, four mental health courts, the Veterans Treatment Court, and three juvenile delinquency drug courts. Ms. Sima has a background in social work and teaches a drug and alcohol class at San Bernardino Community College. Deborah helped develop the California Coordinators Working Group Network in 2001 and is currently the chairperson. She is faculty member for the National Drug Court Institute and vice president of the California Association of Collaborative Courts. Welcome, Deb. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today um, and for this very uh, brief, we only have, you know, about 15 minutes really to talk about what Doug Marlowe is talking about. Um, so we're going to break down what he said into three different slides. This first one is um, regarding the objective eligibility and exclusion criteria. Um, what I have found um, in overseeing all of our different types of drug courts is that if you don't have your eligibility and exclusion criteria written down, that's how you get into subjective criteria. Um, if your criteria uh, is not defined in writing, people start to um, make um, up ideas on who should come into the program. Um, the criteria needs to be communicated uh, to appropriate staff. It's another lesson I've learned on having multiple drug courts at multiple different sites is that one drug court would accept a client in their jurisdiction, but they wouldn't accept them in another. So having objective criteria written down and shared with everyone in some form of a protocol or even a handout, just a handout, and for new staff that rotate in and out, if it's written down, they don't need to guess about who you're taking in uh, to your program. I still hear, and I've been doing this a long time, I still hear in some of our case conferencing um, probation officers or others saying, I just don't think they're going to make it. I worked with this person before and they haven't been successful and so I don't think we should bring them into our program. My general response is please share that crystal ball with me because I don't have one and I've been wrong on many occasions on who I thought was going to make it and who wasn't. 
I, I think if you've all gone to a graduation, you've experienced that with going, wow, we really had, you know, some doubts about this person coming into the program, but here they are graduating. Um, I think you want to hear that. Uh, from your team members because that means that you brought somebody in that subjectively you didn't think was going to finish the program, but indeed they did. Um, so suitability determinations have been found to have no impact on drug court graduation rates or reducing recidivism. The next part is who you're going to treat. Um, your high risk and high need participants. I did see on the poll that there are several people that put in they're going to treat the low risk and high need participants. Um, I, ideally, the high risk, high need participants is who you want to serve. Now, I, I asked them to put this on the slide regarding kind of a definition of high risk because if you have been uh, schooled um, it, you know, in the, uh, it, with the lens of probation or even the DA or maybe even the judge. Risk means risk to the community. It means um, they have uh, violence uh, and that, you know, they, they are going to pose a problem to the community. That is not what we're talking about in drug courts. Risk means that they have a high uh, probability of not completing a program and picking up a new probation violation. Those are the people who we want to um, impose this supervision on, supervision of the court by having them come back on a regular basis, and of course supervision of probation um, who is going to interact directly with the treatment team every single week and find out how somebody's doing. When we're talking about need, we're talking about candidates who are um, addicted to illicit drugs or alcohol, um, but also have other needs. It's not just about drugs or alcohol. Low employment rates, um, lack of education, um, lack of housing. Um, some of these things, um, lack of job skills, you know, other things that, you know, they have a high need uh, to have other needs met rather than just um, the issue of drugs and alcohol. These are our candidates. If you are unable to meet um, the high risk, high need participants, you would want to develop an alternative track. That doesn't mean necessarily that you have to have a separate calendar, because I know that's difficult and takes time and, um, you know, um, the court might say we don't have any more room for any more calendars. It really means at your treatment center that those um, that have low risk but high needs um, are following a different track. They probably don't need as much community supervision and they probably don't need as much time coming to court. Um, so you might want to, you know, that's what we need, mean by a separate track for your participants. Uh, we realize not everybody's going to fit into one track. Um, so if you can provide separate groups um, and have them come to the court um, and, the, and the goals and treatment plan are written a little bit differently for that person, that's absolutely fine that they be in your drug court. They just might not need the level of supervision that a high-risk, high-need participant might need. Um, so there are alternative track materials. In 2012, the National Drug Court Institute published a fact sheet on how to develop alternative tracks for different populations. And we're going to have a slide that's called the resource slide, and that fact sheet can be found on there. There's also a website for um, at NADCP, National Association of Drug Court Professionals, and they have a research library. And you might want to check in there also for the different monographs on developing different tracks for people. So um, I thought this was important to put this in because there's been a lot of research done on drug courts. And um, I don't know if you've all been exposed to that research, but you should know this, that drug courts that accepted participants with non-drug charges had nearly twice the savings. In other words, people that aren't there for specifically for a charge for drugs under the influence possession, whatever, but have other charges, um, um, actually do as well, if not better, in the program. So they're, they're, you're looking at people that um, maybe have um, uh, charges for theft, 
that's a big one that comes into our program. Uh, charges for prescription fraud. Um, people write it, even, even identity theft. If your DA and others will tolerate these people, they can save you a tremendous amount of money. Um, and, they, and these people do well under that kind of supervision. Uh, so I would just want you to consider taking in people that, had no, that have non-drug charges. And here's the other slide that made a difference for us in our um, coming up with our new eligibility requirements when both Prop 63 passed, um, or, or Prop 36, and um, Prop 47. We had to reevaluate our eligibility. And so this research has already been done for us, and it shows that um, participants with prior violent charges it really it had no significant differences between graduating or not graduating, or recidivating and not recidivating. They were about the same. So I, I say this so that you're not afraid of accepting people that have some violent charges in their past, such as domestic violence. Uh, it's a pretty common charge for people that are using drugs and alcohol. Let me back up one more time, if we can, Octavio, to the last slide. Because this is something that I, I wanted to bring up about violent crimes. Um, and it has to do with if you have a weapon or not. Most of our clients, um, the charge does not really reflect what happened. Um, so when we're talking about the use of a weapon, the question to ask your, um, you know, those um, um, that are, that are uh, like your DA, even your public defender or your probation officer, What's the report say? What, what, what happened at the event? Because more times than not, the uh, uh, weapon was brandished, usually at a family member or something they, somebody they know, usually because they're completely paranoid and, um, or they can't get their drugs and they're going through withdrawals. I mean, terrible things happen, but they don't mean to be violent, but they're critically upset and things happen. So all I'm saying is just dig deep and look at the report. Also, we call all of our victims and ask, what do you think of this? We want to give this gentleman an op or lady an opportunity to participate in a treatment program, but what's your opinion? Um, and most, again, more times than not, they are family members, neighbors, others that know them and say, please get them help. That's what's going on here. They have an addiction. They act out. Um, we don't want them to go to jail. We don't think prison's going to solve anything. If you can get them help, do it. Other people don't agree with that, and that is honored. Um, you know, it's taken into consideration. But generally, people that have uh, violent charges, um, you know, there's a story behind it. And it's not usually just to harm people. Also, it pr improves public safety. <laughs> When you have somebody that has a violent charge and you put them into a program, they are less likely, certainly during the program um, and even after, to not violate to that degree again. So I just wanted to throw that out there to make, you know, uh, to make a point about violent charges. Um, of course, your team will have to decide, you know, what they can tolerate, but just know that they do no better or no worse than anybody else that come into the drug court programs. Okay, so the validated eligibility assessments. Um, you want to use something concrete and something that is objective. Um, generally, you know, when you go into a treatment center, people have a validated assessment tool. This eligibility assessment tool is before they get into treatment. So it will give you most of the ones, and we have a, a couple of them we're going to give you here, um, gives you a score, you know, to tell you, um, how, you know, at what level somebody is at risk for repeating. Um, their violations or for not completing treatment and, and what their needs are. It will also help treatment to decide, you know, do we have the resources available uh, to do this. But these risk and need assessment tools, um, these are the ones most commonly used in California. So the strong assessment tool, um, I have not used that and I'm not sure if it's in public domain. I know we have used the compass and just uh, turned over to the case 
assessment tool. I know one is longer than the other, so you have to look at, you know, besides that that's a validated um, eligibility criteria, you also have to look at the cost and how long are these assessments. If you have the time to do a long assessment, great, you know, you, you, you have several to choose from. Uh, but there are several that don't take that long, that can be done right in court and um, when, when, when people come in and, you know, don't take that long to get uh, the results. So the um, LSCMI assessment tool, the level of service and case management inventory is a good one. And of course, um, the, the correctional assessment and intervention system is a very good tool to use too. So these are just a few um, that are used in California. They're, um, you know, they, they take away uh, the professional judgment uh, for predicting success um, just and, and make it just more reliable. Um, so again, the other resource tools can be found on the NADCP's compiled list of evidence-based assessment tools and can be, find, can be found on the resource slide. So disqualifications. Um, having done a little bit of inventory across California with different drug courts as to what um, generally are your complete um, non-eligible requirements for people coming in, we come up with gang involvement, weapons charges, rape, and registered sex offenders. Now, here's the thing I want to say about um, <laughs> generally just the term gang involvement. I think you need to ask your probation officer and your potential participant, are you actively engaged in a gang? Um, is this something that you plan on continuing? Most gang members, active gang members, will tell you, yeah, that's my family. That's, that's, who, that's who I am. Okay, maybe not a great candidate for your program. However, there are some that have the marks on their bodies from tattoos um, or have been identified by the um, Gangs and Drugs Task Force as being a gang-involved member, but they want to get out of the gang. They want to improve their life. They're at a point now where they want to do something different. That's an excellent candidate to bring in. Um, it is, as long as they're not bringing trouble with them into the treatment center, um, and, and they really are make, looking to make a clean break, um, these are people you probably want to give, give an opportunity to. Uh, our love has been that they do change, that they get out of the gang, that they, make, they, they have more productive lives, and that generation to generation is broken of, of um, being born into or beaten into the gang. We've had great success with these people. Weapon charges, again, what kind of a weapon was it? Are we just talking guns that eliminate people? We have done a lot of focus groups throughout the years with our drug courts. Again, we had nine at one time, now we have seven, and we ask people, um, you know, did you ever carry a gun while you were out there in your addiction? And almost everybody said absolutely yes, not to use, but for safety. They were just paranoid, and of course, it times they were carrying around, you know, um, dope. <laughs> They're carrying around illicit substances and they were afraid of, you know, and people know them. So mostly they used weapons, uh, kept them in their car, under their seat, in, under their mattress, at home in a drawer, um, kind of concealed, uh, and, it, and it wasn't to hurt somebody, it really was to protect themselves. Um, so you just want to ask about that. And, and oftentimes weapons are not guns, they are other um, apparatuses that people use to um, threaten others. And so you want to find out exactly what that was and, and what their plan was. Now, I don't think there's anybody that's going to argue about any kind of rape charges, um, but there is that new date rape thing that's, you know, these, this is new in the last maybe 10 years that it's really coming to our attention, and uh, you need to look at the circumstances behind that. Again, it might be an automatic absolutely no, but it's also something that if somebody was using under the influence and had um, these drugs at their disposal and that's how they use them in their addiction, um, that might be something you want to look at. Again, it's almost public safety if you can get these people um, into a program, responding to a judge, responding to treatment, and changing their lives. 
registered sex offenders. We actually have taken in a couple of registered sex offenders because the length of time from when they registered as a sex offender was 30 years ago. You always stay in that system. Has your lifestyle changed? Yes. Um, have you ever offended again? No. Um, could this have been, you know, uh, consensual sex, however illegal, between a, you know, 17-year-old and a 22-year-old? Certainly. So I'm just suggesting to, you know, you want to look at those charges and make sure that you're excluding the right people. Um, the whole idea of drug court is to include as many people as possible. Why? Because the outcomes are great, people respond to the court, people respond to treatment, um, and it's better than getting no treatment at all. I do want to say on, on back on that last screen, sorry, um, thank you, that another one that comes up a lot, are, of course, are the domestic violence um, charges that people have. Again, I would, I would just caution you on not um, excluding everybody with a DV charge. It might be a, a low-level misdemeanor charge, and again, if you ask the victim, most victims will say, I want him or her to get help. Um, you know, they're going to go to jail, they've been to jail before on this, they're going to get out, and nothing's changed. If they want to see change. Uh, they want to see uh, that they're protected. So to have a probation officer that comes by their house and finds out what's going on, to they can go to court with somebody every week, um, if, if, unless there's a restraining order. Um, these, are, these are charges that people actually respond to very well in uh, drug court. All right, clinical disqualifications. So we're talking about um, chronic homelessness, severe mental illness, um, are, and people not addicted. Um, in chronic homelessness, I, I have talked to several different drug courts that actually do serve the homeless population for a couple of reasons. Um, they want them to be accountable, and they want them to not be homeless. So they bring them in, and they most probation officers know where the homeless live. They know where their camps are. They go find them, um, or they know where they're living. And uh, but they do have them come in for treatment. They do drug testing. They give them showers and food, and get them to a place where they might be able to look at doing community service or even getting a job. So you could actually help break the. Um, homelessness for that, that this person is going through by bringing them in. Um, I know it's uh, a difficult population. Uh, sometimes the homelessness just want to be homeless and do not want to make changes, but not everybody. They just don't have a place to live. They burned out all their avenues. I, I just want to suggest that you not automatically um, exclude them from the program. Severe mental illness, you know, really you need a separate track for those with severe mental illness. People can and are treated all the time for mental health issues and are stable and can participate. But there are those that those demons are, are, are just still dwelling within them and they cannot pay attention and cannot seem to absorb the information like a regular drug court client. You might want to consider a separate track. And of course, what's the point in treated in treating a non-addicted person in a treatment court? There's no benefit whatsoever to the program or to the person. Um, and so don't waste your resources on somebody that's not addicted. Somebody that's abusing, um, using and abusing can clearly stop, and you might want to have a separate track for them. We're talking about people that you know, go through the clinical uh, withdrawals and really need help, and they need help with their, um, with their refusal skills and relapse prevention skills. Those are people who you want to target for your program. Um, let's see, those, well, those are the, the most important, I think, features or factors of this um, webinar and from what Doug Marlowe said. So I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. Thank you so much, Deb. That was very comprehensive and a good overview of what uh, needs to be understood about uh, these early these early standards. I want to mention a few resources for you. Uh, the National Drug Court professionals have compiled a list of risk and need assessment tools that have been validated for use with addicted individuals in substance abuse or the criminal justice system. 
although not exhaustive, the risk and needs assessment tools provided, uh, provided this list uh, are really there for uh, your use and your referral. Another source is how to create alternative tracks to match uh, your program to the needs of your clients. And I think Deb talked about this earlier. Uh, the NDCI has published a fact sheet by Doug Marlowe uh, on alternative tech tracks. You want to look at that very closely uh, and to take opportunity to, to discuss those among yourselves. Um, I also like to mention uh, the point of sort of a, a personal privilege and advertisement. The Judicial Council is also available and a resource to uh, assist you. Uh, so we have a question that just came through. Uh, we're going to ask that question. It's one for you, Deb, and I think it's one that people might be interested in. They said, uh, how do you become a part of the California Coordinators Work Group, and, and what is it? Oh, excellent question. You show up. We do. <laughs> we don't have a board of directors. We're not a nonprofit. We are just a group of professionals working in this field that that found a need to come together to share information and to ask questions of one another. You know, when we first started 20 years ago, we didn't know how to do a graduation, where, when, how often. Uh, we didn't know how to impose uh, sanctions uh, effectively, and we didn't know how to gather or gain incentives. So some of us coordinators just got together and started meeting. Um, over the years, it has grown. We have about 30 people that come to our meetings. Um, if you want, we're having a meeting February 17th. It's going to be wonderful. We have a couple of speakers coming on ACA and what you can um, what you can bill for, and uh, uh, we have some information on Prop 47. And um, Dennis Raleigh from the Center for Court Innovation is going to be there. They want to talk to you. We want to talk about the innovation grants that went out. So there's a lot that we talk about, and it's just a great networking group. Um, if you want to be part of that, um, come to our coordinator meeting. I might have given the wrong date. But you can get um, Michael Roosevelt will send, will send out the information. We have a flyer on it. Or you can go to the California Association of Collaborative Courts website, and the registration form is right on there. We'd love to have you. You don't have to be a coordinator <laughs> to come to the California Coordinators Working Group. It is really just a group of professionals that need to network. Uh, thanks so much, Deb. We don't have any more questions, but let's wrap up here. Uh, please complete the evaluation form. That's important for us, and we need your feedback to kind of know uh, how to improve, uh, to expand, and to ensure that we're providing the content that you want. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon and look forward to having you participate in the future. The second webinar of the series, Standard 2, Historically Disadvantaged Groups, will be held on Wednesday, February the 17th. Uh, from 1215 to 1245, uh, registration uh, will be open and continues to be open. We look forward to seeing you in that next webinar.